right, so this is just going to be a brief review of the study guide for exam two. I'm just going to hit the highlights here, but if you have any questions as you're studying, feel free to email me. Remember that the exam is going to be 50 questions, multiple choice, true, false, and matching. You'll have 75 minutes to take it, and there will also be those two opinion questions um, that you will definitely get the points for eventually if you don't get them initially, so you may see your grade go up a bit after the exam closes. So. The uh, second exam is going to cover the end of infancy and early childhood, so only the social development part here. And then all of the information on middle childhood, so physical, cognitive, and social development, which I think worked out well because there was some overlap between social development in infancy and early childhood and social development in middle childhood. All right, so briefly here, we talked about parenting styles a couple of times in this section about how we have uh, parental control and parental involvement, and then we have combinations of those. So authoritative parenting is high on both. Neglectful or uninvolved parenting is low on both. And then you have permissive parenting that is high on affection, low on discipline, and authoritarian parenting that is high on discipline, low on affection. And so we talked a little bit about outcomes, but authoritative parenting is uh, typically associated with the best outcomes. Um, attachment to fathers and mothers, we said that kids often form attachments to mom first, and then maybe seek out mom and dad for different kinds of things. Uh, dad may be considered more of a playmate, whereas mom might be um, more a source of comfort, that kind of thing. Um, we talked about attachment styles and how this research primarily uh, focuses on taking a child to a new setting, separate them from mom, usually mom, but some parent, um, for a certain period of time, and then reuniting them and seeing how they behave. So kids who are securely attached will um, trust that parent will come back and will be excited when parent comes back. Um, kids that are avoidant, um, who have trouble with intimacy and commitment, um, will likely not care that parent leaves and then continue to be distant even when parent comes back. And then uh, resistant or anxious ambivalent kids might then be very upset when parent leaves and then when parent comes back, very uh, continue to be upset, clingy, I can't believe you left me, please don't leave me again. And then you can have disorganized attachment, um, which is more rare, but where a child has kind of a strange combination of some of those other attachment styles. Um, we talked about basic emotions developing first and then complex emotions developing later. So basic emotions being things like happiness and sadness and surprise and anger and disgust. And then more complex emotions that are more culturally specific. Um, things like um, shame and guilt and embarrassment and pride. So you have to understand a little bit about social norms before you can feel these more complex emotions. We talked about different types of play, um, mostly associated with age, about how as kids get older they cooperate more with each other during play. Um, we also talked about how we can see kids who are kind of wandering aimlessly and hovering, kids who seem like um, they're not comfortable engaging with other kids. And that's not necessarily a problem, but it could potentially be a problem. And so for those reasons, um, if you see a lot of this behavior, you might want to think about an assessment, you know, making sure that the child is okay there. But you can look back over the types of play, um, altruism, talking about trying to engage in pro-social behaviors, thinking about doing things for the betterment of other people, even if we don't necessarily benefit from them ourselves and about how we want to encourage kids. Um, we want to model this kind of behavior for kids. We want to um, help develop empathy in kids so that they can be you know, positive uh, social individuals. We talked a little bit about gender differences, um, about how we have differences sometimes based on nature, sometimes based on nurture. So for example, we see that girls might be uh, a little bit more likely to engage in relational aggression. Boys are more likely to engage in physical aggression. Or we might see that girls do better on verbal tasks and boys do better on spatial tasks and those kinds of things. And we ask ourselves the question, is this because we teach our sons and daughters differently and parent our sons and daughters differently? Or is it something that's biological? Uh, and oftentimes the answer is there's, there's some combination. 
Um, we do see that with identical twins, they tend to be a little bit more similar in um, their kind of gendered play, that kind of thing, um, than others, which suggests there could potentially be a genetic component. But we do know that we, we sometimes parent um, sons and daughters differently. They sometimes have different environments that they're being raised in. All right. And then we talked about middle childhood. Um, we don't necessarily have exact years for middle childhood, but we're usually thinking about elementary school kinds of ages here. So with cognitive development, we have that concrete and then formal operational, um, mostly concrete, that 7 to 11 age range, um, but then formal operational would still probably technically start in middle childhood. Um, really middle childhood ends wherever you think adolescence begins, which is controversial. Um, but with a concrete operational period, that's referring to Piaget's um, view that kids from about 7 to 11 do best when they're asked to think logically about something that's right in front of them, not thinking about abstract things, but something tangible. And then when you move into a formal operational period, then uh, the person is able to think logically about abstract things that are not necessarily right in front of them. Um, which would start at 11, but then would continue to develop throughout um, the remainder of a person's life. We talked about memory, so things like long-term memory, um, having a long duration, large capacity, basically unlimited in duration and capacity, versus short-term or working memory. Remember that working memory involves actually manipulating something here, so it's not just holding on to the information, but doing something with it but both short-term and working memory would have limited duration and a limited capacity as well. We talked about memory strategies, just a few examples, um, testing yourself, making up your own examples, elaborating on the information can help you retain that information. Basically anything that helps you go from your working or short-term memory into your long-term memory about how young kids usually use strategies that don't work as well. Uh, you know, things like rehearsal um, are not really great at getting things into long-term memory, but as kids get older, they learn a little bit more about how to study, that kind of thing. Um, Meta-memory refers to what you know about your own memory. So whether you know that your memory is accurate or inaccurate, the classic example about meta-memory is eyewitness testimony. Someone who has poor meta-memory may think that their memory is very accurate when it's not. So if you're not an accurate judge of your memory, then your meta-memory is poor. But if you're aware of the errors in your memory and how well you remember something, then your meta-memory would be higher, be better. We talked about different theories of intelligence, things like Gardner and Sternberg. I mean, we have multiple intelligences, or do we just have one intelligence? And this is important because our definition of intelligence informs our intelligence testing. So we talked about um, things like the WISC and the WACE, the Wexler test, about how there are um, four major areas, right? So we have verbal comprehension, um, processing speed, working memory, and spatial reasoning. Um, there and the point of that is to get an overall IQ score that you can compare with your same age peers um, to see if a person is in an average range, above average, below average, and to hopefully use that information to um, make decisions about how to educate a child um, to improve educational opportunities. We talked about a stereotype threat that sometimes if you know that people have a certain expectation of you that can create anxiety so I think the example I gave here would be um, if girls have been told their whole life that they're not good at math and then you tell them, I'm about to give you a math test to see if you really are uh, less adequate at math than boys, then that will hurt a performance of a girl because she'll be anxious about that stereotype that you've placed on her. People may be afraid of confirming the negative stereotype that people place which then is kind of a self-fulfilling prophecy because it increases anxiety and decreases performance and then can um, quote-unquote confirm that stereotype there. 
So we have exceptional learners. We have kids who are gifted, who are ahead. We have kids who are behind, who have uh, learning disabilities or intellectual disabilities. And so we need to understand that um, these situations do exist. Sometimes people think that learning disabilities or attention issues, these things are um, just made up, but they do exist. And so we should find ways to tailor our education to be more appropriate um, for those kids. Okay, uh, we talked about physical growth that's going on here, about differences in boys and girls in this growth. You know, girls may have a growth spurt a little bit before boys, um, and we see that the physical growth is correlated with motor skills, about how we have different body styles in boys and girls. And girls tend to have uh, more body fat, and boys tend to have more muscle. And the muscle that boys have might then cause them to have an advantage with some uh, gross motor skills, so things that involve strength, for example. Whereas girls tend to do better with fine motor skills, things like handwriting, uh, that kind of thing. All right, and then in our discussion of social development in middle childhood, we talked about viewing the family as a system. So not just that the parents dictate the outcomes of the kids, but that there is a dynamic process going on where the family are interacting with each other, but then they're also impacted by the culture at large, other things going on outside of the home. We talked about how it is very dangerous to have negative conflict in front of kids. It's associated with bad outcomes. Um, we've talked about having to um, try to reduce this risk by handling conflict in a mature, healthy way in front of kids. Uh, about how sometimes um, the parents cause negative outcomes in the kids, but the kids can cause negative outcomes in the parents because some kids are harder to parent. We talked about uh, adopted kids that tend to do better, but might be at an increased risk for school problems or behavioral problems or psychological problems, especially if they're older when they're adopted and they had some previous negative uh, situations before they're adopted. Uh, so something like counseling for that child or for the family at large is probably a good idea there. We talked about the fact that the divorce rate is about 50% and that that's unfortunate because we do see negative outcomes associated with divorce. Um, kids whose parents divorce are more likely to divorce themselves. They're more likely to have symptoms of depression, thoughts about self-harm, and this can also cause them to have uh, problems with their relationships with their parents. And then if divorce is increasing, then blended families will be more common where we have step-parents, step-siblings, etc. cetera. Um, and so we talked about how subsequent marriages are more likely to end in divorce than first marriages. Uh, and so there's a lot of uh, conflict that can come up when you're um, trying to co-parent and you have kids that are your stepkids and you have kids that are your biological kids that just makes things more complicated. Not that this can't be done well, it can be, but unfortunately sometimes it's not done well. We talked about how child abuse is unfortunately very common and about trying to reduce the risk of child abuse. Anything we can do to redu reduce stress uh, to try to um, improve good parenting, so encouraging parents, uh, parent management training, education. The biggest thing we talked about here is that um, cultures that endorse corporal punishment, uh, physical punishment, spanking, as an example of that, um, you see more abuse in those cultures, and we talked about some of the negative uh, outcomes associated with and correlated with um, using spanking and other physical uh, punishments. So one of the best things we can do is try to educate and try to give parents other options for discipline. We talked about friendships, the importance of friendships, about how um, younger kids usually choose friends based just on common interest. But as you get older, you maybe choose friends because of certain psychological traits that you're looking for in a friend, wanting to have you know, trust and intimacy and how we sometimes have groups of friends that influence us. And so if you have good authoritative parenting, you're more likely to be involved with other people that have good authoritative parenting, and then better behavior is more likely versus parents that have more neglectful or permissive parenting. Um, those kids might then group together and engage in um, some less pro-social behavior. We talked about the effects of peer pressure and how we're especially likely to give in to peer pressure when we're younger and when um, 
we feel like we really want to be like the person, if we consider this person of high status, or if we're not really sure if this is okay or not okay, so it seems like an ambiguous situation here. We talked about media, specifically the TV and video games, about how this is not necessarily a problem in and of itself, but you want to steer away from anything that has violent themes or themes that encourage behaviors that you don't want your kids to have. And you also want to make sure that this is not replacing helpful things that kids need to have going on, things like exercise and reading and interacting with other people. So it's not the fact that TV and video games are the problem, it's that they're often replacing something that shouldn't be replaced. And then we talked about prejudice, finally, as an attitude that we have towards other people because of a group membership, whether it be race or gender or age or appearance or any number of things. And we said that in young kids, prejudice usually develops because we like ourselves and therefore we like people who are like us. But unfortunately, that could then progress into disliking people who are different from us. And so the best thing you can do to reduce prejudice is to educate, to bring people together on an even playing field so that one uh, group of people is not in authority over the other and then also try to have them on the same team, so give them a common goal to work towards. And kids can usually understand concepts of fairness, so then using examples here, would it be fair if one group of people got this treatment and another group of people got different treatment? And the child says, no, that's not fair, and that could be a great way to start a conversation with your kids about prejudice. All right. This has just been a quick overview of the information for exam two. If you have any questions as you're studying, please feel free to email me. Otherwise, I will talk to you guys after exam two. Y'all have a great day.